So happy Mother's Day, King William. Hey, uh, I hope I hope all your mothers got uh, got the carnations that Annie brought to you. Um, there's actually a, a reason for carnations. It's uh, you know with with roses the petals fall off, whatever. But with carnations the petals don't fall off they kind of curl up in towards the heart and apparently that's just some kind of a gushy lovey way of expressing your your love to moms but uh i i hope you enjoy them it, we, we i wish we could have both been there uh to wish you happy mother's day but so today happy mother's day everybody yeah even you wayne <laughs> anyway do you, do you ever get stuck um, trying to figure out what to put in, in, in your Mother's Day card? I mean, I love my mom, and, and man, I must have given her almost 60 <laughs> Mother's Day cards through the years. But after a while, I start running out of stuff. I don't know what to say that would be original anymore. You know, um, I mean, how many ways can you say, love your mom? How many ways can you say, you're the best mom? You know? Um, it just drives me crazy because I like to try to be a little unique or, or, or original, but you know, anyway, I learned it's not the originality of the gesture. It's the sincerity of the gesture. So, I mean, really, I mean, do we stop telling our wives, I love you just because we've said it that way before? Yeah, right. Try that and get back to me and let me know how it works for you. <laughs> So anyway, but you know, one great thing about Mother's Day is that it's so needed and it's so deserved because we often take motherhood for granted. I know, I know I do. You know, we, we, we just, we're, we're so used to having moms around. We're so used to the, the way that they love us and take care of us. Really, we, we take that for granted, and it's not just, and the husbands take it for granted, the kids take it for granted, and we take it for granted for society as well, the difference and the impact that moms have. And mother's impact is eternal. Mother's impact is huge. What a child becomes is largely determined by his mom. I, I don't know if you grasp that, but I mean, mothers spend three times as much time with their kids than the fathers do. So they've got more influence, right? I mean, if, if, uh, if you know, you're watching the Super Bowl and they're, and they're interviewing this 400 pound linebacker and he's a monster, he's a mountain of a man. He could rip your head off and spit down your neck. And what does he say on the TV? Right? <laughs> there, there, there's their influence right there. But anyway, so hey, thank God that, uh, that we have moms that understand this. Thank God that he's given us a roadmap, kind of a recipe for godly mothering. And I bet you didn't know this. Proverbs chapter 31. Now, if you got your, please, I hope you have your Bible. Please have your Bible. Um, turn to Proverbs chapter 31. Chapter 31 is an amazing chapter in the Bible. Um, we're going to learn about the, the Proverbs 31 wife that uh, a lot of old-timer Christians talk about. Uh, but it's, in essence, it's God's, it's God's Mother's Day card, acknowledging all of the moms who have followed his plan. And so, <clears throat> now, look, we're, we're not going to read this to beat each other up about it. You know, I don't want you to like all of the, oh, I, just, I, I haven't lived like this, so oh, woe is me. No, that's not the point of doing this. Because honestly, few moms really live out this description perfectly. But see, the thing is, God gave us something that we can point to, something we can aspire to. It's, it's, his, um, it's his ideal. And every mom, can pray and every mom can strive to be like the Proverbs 31 woman. So, and on top of that, even us, uh, us, even the older experienced moms or the grandmothers, 
this is a great chapter to allow you to reach out to the younger moms and teach them and encourage them about God's standard for Christian motherhood. Um, and, and he's got a purpose in the biblical version of motherhood. It's not like uh, he's just talking about something that turned out nice. No, God has a very clear purpose for his version of motherhood. Um, so before we get into it, let's, let's pray real quick. Father, I just want to thank you so much, Lord God. Thank you for the people of our church. Thank you for the moms in our church. Thank you for my own mom. Because, Mom, I know you watch these every once in a while. So I'm just, <laughs> just thankful for my mom. I'm thankful for the ladies in the church who have given their lives for their kids. They have poured out their lives for their kids because it was their heart's desire to do so. Not of compulsory obligation, but purely out of love. And Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for the work you're doing in our hearts. You're growing us. You're challenging us. Even in these times when we can't meet together, Lord God, you're still amongst us all. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so you want to, let's dive into this a little bit. Now, there's some scriptures we don't have to turn to. For example, like in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 is an important chapter, especially when you're witnessing to people. But there's a little uh, apologetics, kind of a clause in there that says, you know, every man is without excuse. Why? Because God has made himself known everywhere. He's made himself known in nature. He's made himself known in all nature of things. Uh, give me, I'll give you a more uh, per precise example. It, Roman, Romans uh, chapter one uh, would, would say that, hey, we showed you in the, in the uh, institution of marriage it, that it's a reflection of Christ and the church. Okay. Well, there's other things that God has done where he's left breadcrumbs. He's left clues about himself, about what he's like, and, 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 and about what he wants from us. And so one of the things that we're going to find out is that there are some traits that God has embedded into men and fathers that reflect God. Good traits, the good traits that men have. For example, men are, uh, are known to be protectors or men are known to be providers. These are attributes of God, but God has placed them in men to point to him kind of like you've got the the moon reflecting the sunlight off of the sun and and that's 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 what you know men reflect the heart and the attributes of god sometimes all right and and women are the same way women have traits different traits than men that reflect the heart of god the attributes of god so we're going to learn a little bit about that okay so when God's plan, when God planned it, he wanted himself to be seen in marriage. He wanted himself to be seen in the actions of the Father. And he wanted us, his, 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 himself to be seen in the actions of the mother. Okay? So, for example, God's plan to see when mothers are great, when mothers are really, really good, for example, at nurturing. When they're nurturing, they're teaching us, they're showing us that God's desire is for us to grow and, and that he sustains us. Because anything man can do, God can do better, right? So if, if moms are really great, and they are, at compassion, man, they just, they, they, they excel in compassion. So that teaches us, well, God made them, God gave them that that attribute, that trait. So God himself must be full of compassion, even better than our moms. So moms can be protective like a, like a, like a mama bear, right? Uh, uh, somebody used to say that in politics, mama bear. Uh, you know, you don't want to get a mama bear upset. Uh -oh, you know, she's protective of her cubs. Well, that tells us God's protective. That tells me that someday he's going to vanquish evil. 
and come and rescue and save his own. And when, when moms are joyfully submissive to their husbands, it teaches us that God himself is a loving leader, a loving provider, and that God can be trusted even more than dad, right? So God shows himself who he is. He shows himself to us. He shows who he is in mothers. So that's why I just want to kind of lay this foundation a little bit to understand that there's always something going on where God is being glorified in different ways. I don't want to ever preach a message about, well, hey, aren't mothers great? Yeah, mothers are great. Well, what's that got to do about God? Because God is in, he's, he's involved in mothers. He's involved in motherhood. He created motherhood. He's kind of a mother himself in a way. You remember that, that part where Jesus was saying, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, you who uh, stoned the prophets and, and killed those that we sent uh, to warn you. Um, uh, he said, how I've longed to gather you like a hen gathers his chicks. And you can relate to that, right? It, it, it's like a motherly instinct that God just wants to just embrace his children, but we wouldn't have it. That's what the, uh, it says that in Matthew. I, I can't remember the chapter. But uh, so, moms, you hold societies together. Think, without moms, men are brutes. Come on, men are, men, we're lost without you moms, man. You keep us honest. We long, men, even the brutes, even the, even the biggest, bulkiest uh, uh, a warrior. He longs for his mother's approving smile. And ladies, man, you have no idea of the power that you possess over men. You, you have no idea. You make us want to study harder. You make us want to climb higher. You make us put the toilet seat down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you make us want to fight the giants all to win your heart. Really, all to win your heart. So here's the moms. We're going to read God's, uh, I just wanted a little bit of a touch of theology in there to, to, to have you see that, that God is glorified in motherhood. God is exalted through the good works of moms. So, but we're going to read Proverbs chapter 31, and we could say it's God's Mother's Day card, right? You ready? So now we're going to, I'm just going to read this, and then what we'll do is we'll go back and highlight a few of these verses that pin down motherhood, okay? All right, so here we go. I'm reading um, from the IV. Excuse me, I get my glasses here. All right. A wife of noble character. I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm starting in verse 10, right? A wife of noble character, who can find? She's worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She, she's like the merchant ships bringing her food in from afar. And she gets up while it's still dark and provides food for her family and portions for her servant girls. She can, oh, get a load of this. I love this. She considers a field and buys it out of her own earnings, she plants a vineyard. We'll get into that later. That's awesome. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for the tasks. She sees that trading, her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. And when it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are all clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed, and she's clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes a seat among the elders of the land and she makes linen garments and sells them. So obviously you see what she does for a little side job. And she supplies the merchants with sashes, 
or belts. She's clothed with strength and dignity and can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. And she watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. She ain't lazy. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, as he praises her, saying, Many women do noble things, but man, you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive. If you don't have this highlighted, you should highlight this. Charm is deceptive and beauty is flirting. I'm sorry, fleeting. It's, it's flirting too, but it's fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. I love this chapter. I love the woman described in this. How can you not? Now, it's not talking about a specific person, right? God's painting a picture as to the type of woman that, that he considers somebody that's, that's, that's walking the walk, somebody that's, that's living the way he wants to be, uh, uh, motherhood to be lived out, okay? So the first thing we're going to pick out is in verse 13 and 14. You notice it says, she selects wool and flax and works with her eager hands. She's like the merchant ships bringing her food in from afar. So, I mean, we're, we're starting to, we're, we're going to start getting a, a really clearer and clearer picture of this woman, right? She's a choosy mom. She chooses Jif. <laughs> right now, the young people are like, what? Anyway, what I mean by that is she goes out of her way to get the good stuff. She's not going to get the, her, her tomatoes for, uh, I don't know, whatever you make out of food, whatever, but she's not going to go shopping at the Valero gas station. Are you kidding me? She's going to, if she, because remember, now they had, they, she had to walk. So she'd have to walk all the way down to the food line, or she'd have to walk all the way down to the pig, Piggly Wiggly or whatever. She's going to go the distance to get the good stuff, the good quality stuff for her. She's concerned about the quality of the food, the taste of the food for her, pre, for her, for her family. So she's going to walk as far as she has to to get it. Or she'll walk the distance to get that high quality wool or that high quality flax so she can make linen. She's going to go out of her way to bring in the good stuff, right? She's not going to just throw any old slop on the stove. Like here's some, here's some, uh, uh, what's the rigatoni? What's the ravioli? Yeah, 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 here's a can of ravioli, you know? It, no, no. She's going to take good care of her family. And they're going to have the best clothes that they can afford. Right now, verse 15, verse 15 says she gets up while it's still dark and she provides food for her family and portions for her servants, for the servant girls. So it's kind of self-explanatory. It just means while everybody else is sleeping, she's getting up and she's making breakfast. You know, can you, you got to love the mom who's making breakfast and you're waking up to that smell of bacon. Oh man, that's awesome. But she's given her servant girls material for their work for the day. Now, remember, she's self-employed. She sells clothing. She sells belts. And she's got some girls. She's got some employees that work for her. So while everybody else is still asleep, she's working. She's getting the girls the material for what they need to do for that day. And she's making breakfast for the family. She's a hardworking girl. Now, verse 16, this is the one that excites me. But it excites me in kind of a... Uh, uh, a way here. <laughs> I got to tell you, every once in a while, you're going to run into these ignoramus people that sit there and will tell you, oh, you're one of them Christians. Oh, what are you, or you don't believe in women? Uh, what, do women got to be in the kitchen barefoot and pregnant? Huh? Huh? I want to just slap the stupidness out of their head. I'm sorry. I shouldn't be talking like that as a pastor, but oh, it gets me going because they're so, they don't know. Anyway, let's, <laughs> verse 16, she considers a field and she buys it out of her own earnings, out of her own, 
she's she she's not barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. She's got she's actively employed. She's smart. She's wise. She's a wise investor. She's business savvy. She makes a good deal on buying a lot of land. And she, now she's thinking about planting a vineyard. So it's like, yeah, I got my clothing business going on here, but I'm thinking about planting maybe some olives so that we can sell olive oil in about three years. And that way there, you see what's going on with her? This is a sharp, sharp girl. Lady, mother, sorry. Anyway, I love that. Um, you start to get a, a better, a clearer picture about her, okay? And she works hard, verses 17 and 19. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for the task. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp doesn't go out at night. And in her hand, she holds the distaff and the grasp the handle with her fingers, all right? So basically, again, she works hard. Even into the dark wee hours of the night, she's making clothing for work. She's making clothing for her kids, making clothing for her husband, right? And verse 20, this is where I just start falling in love with this lady. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hand to the needy. And I can picture her. I can picture her taking her kids with her. Say, hey, come on, let's go down to First Street. And you go down to First Street, and there's some homeless guys cuddled up under some, some, some cardboard box. And, and she was working last night. She made a couple of blankets. And she's going to go to the homeless and give the guy some blankets and give the guy some food. And she's bringing the kids with her. <coughs> she's being an example and showing her kids, this is how we treat others with dignity. He's made in the image of God. We need to show him that dignity. I love this. Uh, verse 21 and 22. It says, when it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. And she makes coverings for her bed, and she's clothed in fine linen and purple. Okay, so what, what are we learning from this? We're learning that, obviously, the warm clothes, remember, she buys wool and she buy, buys flax. Well, the wool is for wintertime, right? And she's made warm clothes for her, for her family, for her kids to get through the winter. She's made blankets for the family for the winter. And in the summertime, she has flax, so she's got separate clothing so that in the, in the summertime, you're not, you don't want to wear wool in the summertime, so they're wearing uh, linen. <coughs> but here's the thing. We're getting a little peek into her private life because it's showing you how, even though she's a hard worker, she's mindful of the relationship with the father. She's mindful of the relationship with her husband. When her husband comes home from work, remember he's a well-respected man in the, in, the, in the city. She wants him to come home and find her dressed for him. Not in nasty sweats because she's been working hard all day, which is fine once in a while, but she's, she's going to make sure she's dressed in decent clothing, nice clothes, purple for those special kind of times. And you want, she's making sure she wants to be, she wants him to be proud of her. She wants him to desire her, right? She wants to look her best for him. She, 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 she went out of her way to, to walk two miles down the road to get just the right linen, just the right color purple that reflects the beauty that, that he sees in her, right? This, this is deep stuff. This is great stuff. <coughs> she deeply loves and respects her husband and wants to be pleasing to him. This is painting such a, such a deep, deep picture of the beauty that's in this woman's soul. I hope you're following this. Verse 24. Verse 24 says, she makes linen garments and sells them, supplies the merchants with sashes, okay? So she's making the most out of the abilities that she has. Now, I, you know, I don't want to keep bragging on Annie, but this is the kind of stuff Annie did. I, I've always looked at Annie as being a Proverbs 31 uh, woman. Is she a, 
she wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. But when the kids went to bed, she started a business. She started a cleaning business. And so when the kids went to bed, she'd go out to work for a couple of hours. And when she got more and more business, instead of her taking it upon herself and then not being there for the kids, she farmed those jobs out to other women in the church that wanted to work at nights and be a blessing to their family. Just a wonderful thing that, <coughs> that this woman's doing. She's got her side job, but it's not because the husband is demanding this of her. No, she just wants to do what she can to benefit the family, right? She wants to grow the family holdings so that maybe she can leave the kids a better inheritance or, or maybe a, an extra couple of businesses that the kids can take over to, to, to grow the family, to grow the family wealth or, or, or even just to grow the family stability. She's not doing this for her own benefit. She's not working this hard so she can be driving around in a in a in a, in a uh, an Audi uh, uh, convertible. She's doing this for the family. She's pouring out her love, her time, her her energies, her talents, all into the family. Verse twenty five and twenty six. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Now, it tells us she's clothed. I'm sorry, I skipped verse 25. She's clothed with strength and dignity. So it tells us because of her wisdom, we know she, she fears God. She's a God fearer because we've learned that in scripture elsewhere, it says that the beginning of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And when you have wisdom, you must fear the Lord, right? So others know it. She's got this wisdom. She's got this knowledge of God and, and God's values and, and God's will to the point where other people come to her for advice. And she's very feminine, but she's very strong. Very feminine, yet still very strong. Women can be strong and very feminine at the same time, not trashy feminine. Women can be feminine and strong at the same time. Um, unfortunately, we don't see too many role models on TV anymore about a woman who could be very feminine, yet very strong. But notice it says that she's virtuous and dignified, right? She's, she's virtuous because she's got biblical values. And because of her strength, she doesn't budge on those values, right? Those are integral to her. But, but on top of that, she's dignified. You know, she's, she's, she's a daughter of the king. She's a princess. To, you know, she, she's God's girl, right? So she doesn't swear. She doesn't smoke. She doesn't wear hoochie mama clothing. She's dressed modestly. You know, she fears God. And, and, and she, she wants to best represent her God and best represent her husband in the way that she comes across. But also because she fears God, she's heavily involved in discipling her children, making sure that her children are raised in the ways of the Lord and led to a saving knowledge of him. She relishes that role of taking care of her kids like that. But also there's a confidence in God and there's a confidence in her husband to the point where she can laugh at tomorrow. She could care less about what tomorrow brings because she knows she's in good hands. She's, God's got her. She's in the palm of God's hand. So verse uh, 27 touches a little bit more about she watches over the affairs of the household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Watching over the household, there's a technical term here. We don't have to get into it. But in essence, she's the manager of the home. The husband is the head of the family, but she's the boss of the home. And now she, he honors that position. It's delegated to her actually by God, but he honors that position of, of, of manager. And the home, that he, he trusts her judgment in the home. If she says, honey, you know, we need new windows. These windows are shot. He's going to like, she knows the budget. I trust her judgment. She knows our budget. She knows what the house needs. I trust her. If that's what you want, you're the manager, you do it. If she says, 
don't you come in here after I just wash the floor. You better take your shoes off. He obeys if he knows what's good for him. So anyway, verse 28. Verse 28 says, her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, as he praises her, saying, many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. So it's kind of self-explanatory. Her children and husband praise her and respect her because they see the integrity in her life. They know she loves them, and so they honor her. And verse 30, verse 30, Nick, I hope you're watching this. Nick, this is for you. you gotta, you got to highlight this, Nick. This is important stuff, right? Verse 30. <laughs> Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. So what, I'm going to, let me reword that just a little bit. Some women have charm. And because of that charm, they can hide the fact that they're going to be sucky wives. They're going to be horrible moms. But you might not see it because of the charm. And you've got to be careful about that. Don't let the charm throw you. You're looking for a woman who fears the Lord. She's going to be the good mom. Now, some women have beauty. Some women got really good beauty. But you got to understand that stuff can wear off and, 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 and go away after, after years, right? But man, man, the woman who fears the Lord, that's what you want, dude. What a precious and a, and a priceless find. When you find a woman who fears the Lord, that's a beauty that never fades. That's a woman worthy of high praise. That's a godly mother. This, 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 this was God's Mother's Day card. That's a godly mother. She's loving. She's compassionate. She's faithful. She's trustworthy, we found out. She's protective and eager to bless. That's mom. That's your mom. That's my mom. That's a biblical mom. That's the, that's the Proverbs 31 mom. But even more so, listen, remember, moms reflect the heart of God so that God can be honored, so that God can be praised. God made her, and he put those in her because he's all about them even more. So when we can get excited about our moms, please know we can be even more excited about the God. Who made her that way now back to reality let's get back we gotta, we gotta, we gotta put our feet back on the ground right back to reality because what we just read proverbs 31 please understand that's that's the ideal picture and ain't always reality okay that's that's god's ideal because it always ain't I, it's not always like that, right? Okay, so other parts of the Bible, they teach us other aspects of, of motherhood. Because honestly, we gotta be honest, man. Sometimes, sometimes our children go through dark seasons. That's just the facts. Sometimes our kids go astray. And and you know, you know, a mom. A mom cries her eyes out and prays for those kids, prays for their return. And we see that in God throughout the Bible, that God feels and acts the same way. That's what I'm saying is even in, in the difficult aspects of motherhood, God is still glorified because he feels the exact same way, even more so. Because the Bible tells us he, that he's patient, wanting everybody to repent and come to a saving knowledge of Christ. In another passage in the Bible, it talks about how God loves the backslider. God loves the backslider. And Jesus brought it out best when he used the parable of the, the prodigal son, right? Parable, parable of the prodigal son it talks about God's anxious love. That, that anxious love with a father sitting on the front porch, kind of like looking down the driveway, hoping his son's going to be coming that day. He's got this, this burning, this longing desire to be reunited with his lost child. That's the love 
of a mom. And that's the love of the Father. God, that's the love of God. Okay? So, that's, uh, uh, that's what I wanted you to get out of understanding how, how, how motherhood so closely and so beautifully reflects the love of God. Now, ladies, let me talk to the ladies here for a minute. Some of the ladies uh, that are not moms, please understand. You don't have to conceive and bear a child to walk out your gift of motherhood. I know that's what, 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 did, he, what did he just say? All right, listen, God programmed you with a, um, oh, I'm not a computer guy, but God programmed you, I don't know if I'm even saying this right, with a maternal hard drive. <laughs> You're wired to be maternal, right? And, and, and when you act on that, you proclaim God's love when you care for other people. You're reflecting the love of God when you're caring for other people with that maternal, maternal instinct that he put in you. So when you discover the needs and the hurts of the people in our little church, it, it's going to be natural for you to, to just flow in God's gift as you, as you care for one another. See, men are different. Men are different, though, like, you know, buck up, Skippy. Walk it off. Come on. You know, <laughs> that's what the men would say, right? I can hear Frank saying, yeah, you got that right. Okay, well, all right. So women, you're wired differently, and we need that. We need you. I mean, God doesn't necessarily even want all women to have children. He needs some couples to be made available to take in orphans that he has predetermined that are going to be adopted by Christian parents. He, he needs that. He also needs uh, women that are able to really, really dedicate themselves to the church. I, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Phoebe. Um, I, you know, nobody really hears much about Phoebe, but she's listed at the very end of the book of Romans in chapter 16, the very end of the book. You'll see that Paul kind of really toots her horn quite a bit. He's like, man, she's a key player. You got to take her. You got to treat her like the rest of us, you know, uh, uh, you know, hot dogs. You know, so he's bragging on Phoebe because she has dedicated her life to pouring her life into the church. And Paul recognized her for that. And we need more Phoebes. We need more women that don't have kids, but they have the time available to dedicate to the church. And you know what? In 1 uh, Corinthians chapter uh, 7, Paul talks about the gift of singleness so that they, people, if you're single, that frees you up to dedicate. Like Paul said, Paul said, I wish y'all were like me. I ain't got a spouse, but that way I can be married to the church. I can I dedicate my whole life to serving the church. God needs people like that. So I wanted to encourage moms, you're awesome. You're amazing. And ladies that aren't moms, you've got you you've got you've got mom in you that you could be mothering a lot of us in the church and some of us outside the church as well that need need mothering. But let me let me end by telling you a little story I heard about. Speaking of Frank, you know I heard a story about Frank. You know Frank with the beard that's four feet long looks like the guy from ZZ Top. Well, I heard when he was in fourth grade, he had a math teacher. And this is what happened. The math teacher says, so, Frankie, here's the deal. Let's say your mom makes a pie, and there's five of you. What size portion are you going to get? And Frankie thinks about it, and he says, one-fourth. <laughs> the teacher says, Frankie. Said, I said there were five of you. I don't, I don't, I don't think you, you know fractions. And Frankie says, yes, ma'am, but I don't think you know my mom. Because my mom would say 
she doesn't want any pie. So just a little peek inside of the hearts of moms. Moms, we love you. We appreciate you so much. Yeah. Man, we run out of ways to say it. What greater love, somebody said, what greater love is there than a mother for her child? How much? Nothing I know except one. Because the love that a mother has for her child is a mere reflection of the love that God has for every one of us. So if you're out there and you're, you're listening to this message and you're saying, I don't really, I don't really have the relationship with this God. I, 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 I don't yet know this love of God. Let me, uh, let me encourage you. Take a minute and just ask him to forgive you. He's got that anxious love waiting for somebody to come to him and say, yes, I've sinned against you and I need your forgiveness. God has provided for that forgiveness in his son when Jesus died on the cross for you so that your sins could be forgiven. Just ask him to forgive you and ask Jesus to come in and be the new owner of your soul. Tell him, take over my life from this point on, Lord Jesus. But don't stop there. Go tell somebody that you've made this decision to be a follower of Jesus. Start reading your Bible. Uh, you can start with the Gospel of St. John. It's a good place to start. And then, uh, then I would challenge you to find somebody that you know that's a born-again Christian, a real sold-out born-again Christian, and ask them to help you find a good church. Well, people, happy Mother's Day. We so love you. I hope everybody got their carnation. Um, and we just look forward so much. Oh, and by the way, I think we're going to try to meet this coming Friday again outdoors like we did last time. So until then, may God's peace and grace be upon you all. From God the Father and Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Take care, folks. We love you.